Make sure to remember, uh, even though Shwai, you've already given a talk this session, uh, name and affiliation, please, for questions. Sure. Uh, this is Shwai Lee from University of Hawaii. Uh, I think we have a very great consensus for, for, on our third and fourth uh, bullets with IR observation. We see stronger hydration variation at a mid latitude than lower latitude. And I do not see strong yeah. variation in the Mari region, but I see strong diurnal variation on the Highland region. Okay, good. Yeah. So we're. Yeah, we are. Yeah, good. very well with the <laughs> <laughs> Good. I like your comment. Thank you. <laughs> we have a question online. Oh, boy. Um, from Prasan Mahadi uh, for Amanda, can local roughness affect the fit? Say it again, please. Can local roughness affect the fit? Okay, good question. Um, local roughness, we um, are assuming right now that we're looking at big enough regions that local roughness is kind of um, averaged out, right? Because we're still looking at 30 degree longitude by 10 degree latitude regions. So, you know, we're not looking at like the edge of a, of a rim of a crater or anything like that, where we, we might be concerned about that um, type of stuff. So we're assuming that um, local roughness variations don't come into effect here. Hey, let's thank all of our speakers in this session again. So the session is now open for discussion. Um, one, as chair's prerogative, one thing I wanted to go back to was um, Paul Lucy described that there might be future plans for Sophia before decommissioning to obtain more lunar data. And it would be great if Paul could take about 30 seconds to summarize those. Yeah, um, I, we have um, fairly decent coverage of the moon right now at uh, in terms of latitude and temperature space. So the, the, the water questions we're talking about now um, we'll be able to address. We have four more nights in September before um, Big Bird goes away, and um, we'll be filling in uh, Apollo sites and pyroclastic locations. Currently, we've got all the usual suspects, you know, Reiner Gamma and the Tyson Domes and Aristarchus and Copernicus, and all those things are, are in the can. Um, it's, a tricky, it's tricky calibration. This is pushing the limits of the, the forecast spectrometer, but we hope to have the data um, publicly available we're funded to make it publicly available and we hope to get it out in you know six months to, to a year. And um, so I guess that's the story. Thank you. Thanks so much, Paul. Um, I do like hearing pushing the limits of the instrument towards the very end. That's very exciting to hear. Um, so we've got to go back for the Jones et al talk. Um, this is from W. Farrell online. Um, so if Brant could approach a microphone, and it's kind of a long one, so if you need me to repeat it, let me know. Um, in many of these OH models, there is a water branch and a competing and possibly more vigorous H2 branch. Does your model consider the formation of the implanted protons to the second escaping H2 branch? Could that be a possible reason why the water exosphere in your model might be overestimated compared to the low levels detected by Laddie? Uh, I think that's a lot of implanted H is going to the H2 exosphere. So again, could you also comment maybe on uh, your response to Paul saying that maybe the laddie was an underestimate and, and it just do all the things basically. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay. So yeah, um, I know, I know Bill likes the hydrogen story. Um, the thing is that there's not a lot of experimental data to back that up. So if you go to Ralph Kaiser's experiment where they did, you know, there's proton and radiation and then he heated it up with an IR laser. Um, the dominant channel was water. And that's also in TPD measurements too. Um, and so there is some evidence that there's trapped hydrogen, but the hydrogen has a really relatively low diffusion constant. So it should basically diffuse out. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean <clears throat> that it's a, um, not a relevant channel, right? So in this particular model, no, I did not take it into consideration. And I really haven't taken it into consideration until I talked to Schwai about this, right? Because in order to kind of explain Schwai's results, there has to be trapped hydrogen in the regolith. Um, as far as the number density, the LADI measurements, I don't know if that would really change. I mean, I guess it could change you know, the overall amount if more is going towards hydrogen. 
But again, that doesn't really match what experimental data shows. Okay, hey, thanks so much. And there doesn't look like there's a follow up comment. Uh, there, the follow up comment online is thanks exclamation point. So thank you for that explanation. Um, and that looks like that's everything in the chat currently. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, actually, I'm going to follow up a little bit with Brant. So with our discussion with Shall We, trapped hydrogen is ambiguous as to whether or not it's a hydrogen molecule. That is likely to trap. The thing that's least likely to trap is the hydrogen atom. It finds itself, it'll find a hydrogen molecule that can stick around. There's hydrogen storage materials because that happens. Uh, the question actually is not on that, it's, uh, it's to Amanda. It's more like a question of semantics. So you, you, you use this term scalar, which is the N naught before the exponent in the Arrhenius equation. That is really the attempt frequency. And the attempt frequency has some number, which is exactly what it is. It's the number of times the molecule tries to get away. So it's a frequency and that's not temperature dependent. So that really should not change. What changes in the temperature dependence is in the exponential. So th there's an interesting thing though, that you know, I think what you wanna do is call it an effective activation energy. Because what that does is it takes into account that there's multiple attempts. It desorbs, it reabsorbs, it desorbs, it reabsorbs. And that has to happen if it's coming out of a granular sample. And nobody talks about that, but you know, this activation energy measurement is for just going to the vacuum, one shot. But in almost all of these samples, and particularly the ones on the moon, they're bouncing all over the place. So what it really is is a convolution of multiple desorption events. So I think you need to keep that, and it doesn't say the numbers are wrong, it's just, it, it, the physics is it's many, 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 many yeah, of these attempts. From, yeah, no, that's a good point, Tom, and we've talked about this before, and I think in our paper we even met, said that it's an effective activation energy that we um, think that we're measuring here. Um, and, and, and so, you know, it's just something to keep in mind. Um, and about the scalar, that's another good point too, that we're still kind of working on here, what that means for us, um, because we do get different values that we need. Uh, but it, it has to also do, I think, with the albedo uh, of what we're looking at. So it's, it's kind of wrapped up in there. So we've got to wrap our heads around that a little bit more to figure out what, what that really means. But those are good points, thanks. Okay, thanks so much. Oh, Carly's got a question. Don't forget to introduce yourself, even though I, I literally said Carly's got a question. And then I think this might be the last question of the discussion because we do want to keep about the time because uh, there is a lunar volatiles focus group at lunch. And so if you want to go rush to get your lunch and then go talk more about this, then that would be super, but uh, we're going to let Carly close this out. Okay, here's something to think about over lunch. Um, and this is mostly for people who are doing the physics and the chemistry of these interactions. We're right now grouping OH and H2O together, but they have different chemistry, different physics. How does that affect all the things we've been touching on? I don't have an answer, but that might be a good lunch conversation. I definitely agree with Carly. And if you wanna think about it over lunch, what kind of in situ measurements could we get maybe in the future with some of the technology we've talked about the last day and a half to get that. So with that, let's give our speakers another round of applause.